Welcome everybody to uh, today's uh, Spark webcast that we're hosting in partnership with the Internet Archive. Uh, and we're really thrilled uh, to, to host today's discussion to, to sort of explore how controlled digital lending um, can be used as a strategy both to expand library con uh, collections and, uh, and increase their accessibility. And we're thrilled to have uh, two experts uh, on today to, to share more about um, uh, about the topic, uh, Chris Freeland, the Director of Open Libraries at the Internet Archive, uh, and uh, Michelle M. Wu, uh, Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Library Services at, uh, at Georgetown Law. Uh, so before we dig into the, the presentation, just a few logistical notes. Um, we are recording today's, uh, today's webcast, uh, and uh, anything that you put in the chat box uh, will be captured in that recording, so just a heads up on that. And um, we also encourage folks to, uh, to ask questions or, or uh, reactions, comments, uh, discussion in the chat box uh, throughout the presentation. So uh, you know, please don't feel like you need to wait until the end to ask questions or make comments. Uh, please go ahead and dive right in. It'd be great to have a lively discussion and hopefully you know, we should have some time for Q&A afterwards. Um, so feel free to go ahead and get that started in the chat from the beginning. And then finally, uh, we will be sending out um, a link to the recording of this webcast afterwards once it's available, and that will also come with a survey, um, uh, you know, just to provide feedback both on today's webcast uh, as well as uh, you know, suggestions for topics to cover in future, future Spark, uh, Spark webcasts. Uh, so with that, I will go ahead and turn things over to Chris and Michelle. Thank you both. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, Michelle, maybe I'll start and then uh, um, I'll pass it over to you for introductions. Does that sound okay? Sounds good. Great. So, um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Freeland. Uh, I'm the director of Open Libraries at the Internet Archive. Um, thanks for uh, uh, carving out some time today to uh, to work through this webinar with us. Um, you'll what you'll see today is an introduction to Open Libraries. Um, I'll, I'll walk through that and Michelle will walk us through the legal framework um, that underpins our open library service, which is controlled digital lending. The Internet Archive has been running our controlled digital lending service since 2011 in the Boston area with the, uh, with the Boston Library Consortium and other libraries um, in the Boston area. We've taken that experience and we're now applying it to libraries all over the US in Canada. Um, and, and so that's what we're going to focus on today. It's the goals and vision of open libraries, where libraries fit in, and how controlled digital lending uh, uh, works for the, for the service. So the game plan for today is the following. Um, we're gonna, we'll do introductions in just a second. I'll walk through the, the research problem um, that, we're, that we're positioning controlled digital lending around, and that's uh, turning Wikipedia references blue. Uh, Michelle will talk about controlled digital lending, and then I'll do a demonstration of controlled digital lending in, in action with the Internet Archive's Open Libraries program. And then we'll talk about how libraries can participate, where we get our books, and open it up to uh, Q&A um, uh, at the end of the session. Um, we, are, um, we, will, we, we do have a section for Q&A at the end. Um, as Nick mentioned, uh, we'll use the chat feature for that. Nick is tracking questions as, the, um, as we're working through the session. So feel free in the moment to ask your question in the chat window, and then we'll pick that up at the end. And Nick, if it's something that would, be, that would benefit from sort of an immediate response, please jump in and, and ask that question. We'd really like this to be sort of as conversational as, as possible. Uh, Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So my name is Michelle Wu. I'm the Associate Dean for Library Services and Professor of Law at Georgetown Law. Um, and about, I want to say 20 years ago now, not quite that long, um, I first came up with the legal theory that now underpins CDL. It has, it was not the same name at that time, but it was essentially developed after um, Tropical Storm Allison hit the University of Houston's law library and we lost the entire collection and I started thinking like are there ways for libraries to make better use of their works while still respecting copyright and it turns out that that same method that I came up at that time actually applies through a broad uh, group of scenarios for libraries to help us both with preservation and access and so that's how I got involved in this project. Uh, thanks, Michelle. You know your your research uh, is uh, is central to our cause, and uh, I I uh, give a hat tip to it every time we talk. Uh, it's important scholarship, and so thank you for doing that. Uh, 
Um, I'm Chris Freeland. As I mentioned, I'm the director of Open Libraries at the Internet Archive. A little bit about me and my background. So before joining the Internet Archive, I was an associate university librarian at Washington University in St. Louis, which is where I'm coming to you from today. I'm working from my home office. Um, fair warning, we are at the time, I have two canine office assistants um, who undoubtedly will be making an appearance on the couch behind me. A very large dog will, will jump up at some point throughout the presentation, so let's not be surprised when that happens. Also, we're at the time when the mailman comes. So there's a, uh, if you see me jumping for the mute button, um, it's to try to stop the, the, the barking. So apologies if, uh, if I'm not quick enough on that. Um, I, as I mentioned, I, uh, I'm, I was an AUL at WashU. But I've worked with the Internet Archive for more than 12 years um, working on scanning projects. I was the technical director of the Biodiversity Heritage Library, which is an international consortium of the world's leading natural history libraries. And we partnered with the Internet Archive to digitize more than 200,000 volumes of, of, um, of scientific literature uh, and make those as widely available as possible. So I'm familiar with the way that the Internet Archive partners with libraries, the services that the Internet Archive provides, and I'm really pleased to now be on the inside helping other libraries take advantage of the capacity and the materials uh, and the expertise that the Internet Archive has, uh, has built in this particular space of how do we get access to 20th century literature. So with that, uh, let's, let's get into it. Um, the, the Open Libraries Project was started from a strong belief that everyone deserves to learn. Um, we, our, our vision, our goal is to build a, a research library full of more than 4 million in copyright books that we can make available for users all over the world. The reason for 4 million is that that's the size of a large metropolitan library, like a Chicago Public Library or an LA Public. And we think that everyone, regardless of where they live, should have access to a rich library, a, a, a library that's, that's good enough that you can learn from it, um, in, 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 in it and that it is complete. So um, we all can say, yeah, uh, we, we get that. But maybe uh, I'd like to walk through uh, an example of why this is important. Like, what can we do with 4 million books? And our, our our thought here is um, a very practical way of applying controlled digital lending is to turn Wikipedia references blue. We would like to give Wikipedia contributors as well as readers access to the best library possible. So if you look at, uh, uh, here's, a, here's an example of the Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Wikipedia page, and I'm actually gonna pop over to the live web, which is always a little hairy, um, but I want to show you uh, have these, uh, these links in action. So if I do a search for reference 123, this is in the Chicago housing, uh, open housing movement section of, the Wiki of Martin Luther King's uh, Jr.'s Wikipedia page. And in this section, um, the, the authors are describing the different neighborhoods in which uh, um, uh, there were peaceful protests and demonstrations in the summer of 1966. And if I, as a user, as a reader, follow that link, you'll see that it takes me down to, uh, to this publication from Adam Fairclaw that was published in 1987 called the, uh, To Redeem the Soul of America. And you can see that the author has cited page 299. So at the Internet Archive, we've, gone, we've been working in partnership with Wikipedia and the community to run through all of the citations in the English language Wikipedia. Started there um, because that, that also is a good overlap for the kinds of materials that the Internet Archive has been digi digitizing. So um, we, uh, we've, we've run through, grabbed all of the ISBNs for the materials that are cited in Wikipedia, and we've now written a bot that we are um, going in and connecting all of those links in citations to the scanned books in Wikipedia. And this is important, especially for, the, um, for this book. So you can see that this, is, uh, this was published in 1987. There is no commercially available EPUB for this book. Uh, web learners, digital learners, don't have access. Libraries can't buy or license a, a commercially available EPUB for this document. So for the generation of learners that, that turn to their screen, this book would be absent if not for, for scanning and making available through controlled digital lending. So what you can see here is with one click, 
we've now come to page 299 in this um, in this document and you can see it's it's in this section here um, where the uh, where the author is describing the different um, neighborhoods that were uh, that were participating in the uh, in the demonstrations that summer so this is our vision for uh, for the uh, for the Open Libraries program, we want to connect all of the references in Wikipedia to the scanned content um, to those to those books, so that not only can um, can editors have access to the to these materials, but also readers. It's important we believe in this era of disinformation to provide valued, vetted information as exists in books, and we want to provide users the ability to go check those references. And then if they're interested, you can, uh, if, if I as a user am interested in this topic, then I can log in and borrow this book and, and, read, and uh, read further, dive deeper. And we'll do a demonstration of how that works in just a minute. But that's the overall vision for, for what we're hoping to accomplish. And one of the research problems um, that we're wanting to address is how can we turn those links blue? But the challenge is, is that libraries face is a 20th century one. Um, so I'm showing here a graph from uh, the, the materials that the Internet Archive has digitized. In 1924, um, materials published before 1924 are in the public domain, meaning that we can scan those books and we can put them online um, and, uh, and make them as widely available as possible. But books that are in copyright, books that are published in 1924 and more recently, um, are still in copyright and so can't be made openly available. And you can see here in this graph, this is um, uh, this trough uh, the, the demonstrates, illustrates a bit of the 20th century gap that, that there aren't electronic materials. And in many cases, there aren't even um, books in print. There, many of these books are so widely out of print that they're rare, that they are infrequently held by libraries. Until we get up to the late 1990s, early 2000s, that's when you know commercial ebooks started becoming uh, more widely available. So, the uh, a, another goal alongside the turning Wikipedia references blue to accomplish that, we want to fill in the missing century on our digital shelves. We want to, to unblank the our digital shelves from 1924 to 1999. That that range of materials that exist largely in print and are absent a, uh, a commercially available uh, EPUB. And the way that we do that is through controlled digital lending. And so I'll turn it over to Michelle now to walk us through the, the, the legal basis and the and background information on controlled digital lending. Are Great, we? thanks Chris. Um, so when we're talking about controlled digital lending, really I just wanna make sure that everyone understands what we're talking about first, as well as, um, what required elements are there anytime we use the word controlled digital lending or CDL? So I'm going to walk you through very quickly through the necessary three elements. Any CDL program essentially accomplishes three things or has three elements. The first is that it, the library owns a legitimate copy of the work. So that means that you have either purchased that work or someone has given it to you as a gift. It cannot be materials that are licensed. That's not an owned copy, it's a licensed copy. So that's the first required step. The second is that the library has to res re respect an own to loan ratio. And all that means is if a library owns one copy of a print item, it can digitize it and circulate one copy online. It cannot use both at the same time. So however many copies it owns, that's the number it can use. If it owns five copies of a title, it can use all five digitally, it can use three digitally, two in print, any combination, as long as the total number does not exceed the number that they own. And the last requirement is that uh, the digital copies must be controlled by some sort of digital rights management. And anyone who's used either OverDrive or Adobe Digital Editions already has a pretty good sense of what this means. It means that the user who has checked out this digital item cannot wholesale copy it or redistribute it in any way. So if you take a look at the three elements, what this ultimately comes down to is this. Libraries are seeking to do exactly what they do with their current collection, right? We're looking to lend items that we've purchased. Uh, the only difference is we're trying to change the format. So it's a format shift more than it is anything else. Um, and how do we do this legally? Well, we do it through two different doctrines. We do it through the first sale doctrine and we do it through the fair use doctrine. So I'm going to walk you through each of these in brief. Um, and when I say in brief, I mean really in brief. I know that there may be questions and I welcome those at the end, but usually the questions come in application. So I really do just wanna give the thumbnail right now. 
Um, so the first doctrine we're going to talk about is called the First Sale Doctrine. And this is what allows libraries to lend the materials that they have physically on their shelves. Essentially what it says is once the copyright owner has transferred a copy of their work to someone else, whether through first sale, which is what the doctrine is called, or whether through gift or other method, the copyright owner has given away a copy of their book, Whoever gets that copy or purchases that copy can then do anything to, well, can transfer it downstream or handle it downstream in the manner that they choose. So they can destroy it, they can lend it, um, they can resell it. And as you can see, any number of industries base their entire operations on this. So eBay, used bookstores, used music stores, all of them sell copyrighted works on the resale or secondhand market, and they don't actually pay the copyright owner. So first sale essentially says the owner gets, or the copyright owner gets that payment during the first transaction, but then after that transaction, uh, whoever owns that individual copy can transfer it further. Um, however, so first sale only applies to the actual copy that an individual or a library has acquired. So first sale applies to the physical books that are on our shelves. We're talking about something slightly different. We're talking about digitizing the work and circulating the digitized copy in place of the print. So how do we get there? Well, we get there by going to a different doctrine. We go there by looking at the fair use doctrine. And generally speaking, when we're looking at fair use, this is a very, very broad doctrine that's intended to protect the public interest in a way where Congress has said there are some uses of copyrighted works that are so much in or for the benefit of the public interest that we're going to say that they override the interests of the copyright owner. And you probably see evidence of this every day, whether it's in news reporting and news reporters will show images or snippets of a play and just cover whatever is happening at a given time while they're covering copyrighted work. Similarly, you'll see the same thing when you have art critiques or art commentary where they'll, they might show a painting in full or a statue in full and comment on it. That is considered fair use, as is use in many of our classrooms when we have course reserves or materials that might be copied in brief for their classes. So fair use is generally just, it just stands for a set of uses that Congress has determined um, are, that the public interest is so great that it's worth overriding the, co the copyright owner's normal rights. And the test for fair use is pretty broad. Courts can consider anything they want to, but at a minimum, they have to consider the four prongs that you see on your screen here, which is the purpose, or, purpose and character of use, the nature of the work, the amount and substantiality of the work used and market effect. And we're going to walk through each one of these in brief to see how they apply to CDL. So looking at the first prong, which is purpose and character of use, there are usually two tests here that I won't say that they will kick the test out completely, but they're so powerful that often they dictate the rest of the analysis. So we first have to look at that. Uh, the first question with purpose and character of use is, is the use transformative? And all that means is, is the new use something that was never contemplated by the original copyright owner? It's a completely different use. And the example that I'll give you is the Hadi Trust case. So Hadi Trust created a database from the books that uh, Google had digitized for them. So the database is considered a transformative use. Where a transformative use is found, that typically overrides the rest of the analysis and it becomes a fair use. I do say typically because there are exceptions, but generally speaking, that overwhelms the rest of the analysis. In the case of CDL, I could make an argument that it is transformative, but just for, the his just for the sake of argument, I'm going to argue right now that the history of fair use law, for the most part, would say that the digital copy is not transformative. And the only reason for that is the digital copy serves exactly the same purpose as the print in terms of it's intended for reading, we're circulating an item, and the user is going to read it whether in digital format or in print. So um, just to take a more conservative look at purpose and character of use in regards to CDL, I want to start there. Um, and show that I think the analysis still comes out in our favor. Uh, but the second question is whether or not this use is for a commercial or for-profit purpose. Usually, if a commercial or for-profit purpose is found, uh, the fourth factor gets tremendous emphasis in terms of market effect. And that also similarly overwhelms the entire analysis and often comes out saying that there is no fair use. As we are looking at library use, and in particular, nonprofit library use, we are going to say, in this case, 
it's not a commercial use. So that's not something we have to deal with. So what are we left with? We're essentially left with just a basic analysis of what is the purpose, or purpose and character of use. And in this case, the purpose that libraries have for using CDL is essentially the same as the exhaustion or the first sale doctrine. We're trying to do exactly the same thing we're doing with our print materials. We're looking to lend content that we purchase. We just want to do it in a different format. And we are not creating an additional copy. So even though we have the print and we're digitizing it, so technically there are two copies, we're only using one. We're only using the online version. So for that reason, our general conclusion on purpose and character of use is that it comes out in favor of fair use. So now we're gonna take a look at the next two factors, which I've actually grouped together, and that's the nature of the work, as well as the amount and substantiality of the work that's used. And the reason why I've grouped them together is because courts have determined that overall, these factors are largely neutral. Um, they are context dependent, and they are really sub factors under factors one and four. But I do wanna describe them briefly for you to understand why that's where courts come out. Um, for the nature of the work, Often or historically, what has been said is if a work is more creative, it gets more protection than a work that's not. So a work of fiction is more protected than a compilation of facts is an example. Except now there's a whole body of law that shows that it really doesn't, and I guess it doesn't matter, but even if you have the most creative work possible, there can still be fair use. So again, the example I'll give you again is the Hadi Trust case, where both fictional works were scanned in as well as uh, factual works, and each of those fell under the same analysis. Similarly, when we take a look at the amount of work amount of the work used, usually, historically, it's been said that the more of the work that you take, uh, the less likely it is to be a fair use. But again, the body of law that has developed, especially in the current technological age, is that there have been many demonstrations where the entire work has been taken and it's been fair use. And the one that many of you might be familiar with, in addition to Hadi Trust or Google Books, is anytime you're going on Google Images and executing a search, you're pulling up a series of images, pictures, photos, all of which might be copyrighted, all of which are shown in full, and that is considered a fair use. So if factors two and three are largely neutral, we're going now to go to and take a look at factor four, which is probably the most uh, debated factor, uh, but I also think it's a fairly simple analysis when it comes to CDL. So the market effect factor is a factor that looks at, is the new use one where you're creating a copy that will replace an unsold copy on the market. Essentially, is, is your use actually displacing sales? And the try, or does it have the potential of displacing sales? And that's what they're measuring. It does not protect every market effect. So for example, if someone writes a scathing criticism of a book and market sales drop, that is not protected by the copyright law. It's not protected by this particular analysis. And that's very important as we get through the analysis. So in CDL, uh, is there a market effect? And our answer is there is no more market effect than we have with the purchase with the initial purchase of the book. And this is the reason why. First, the library owns a legitimate copy of the book. So when we acquired it, we already paid that copyright owner. Or if someone donated a book to us, the person who donated it had already paid the copyright owner. So there, a payment has already been made. Second is whatever digital copy we make, it doesn't substitute for an unsold copy of the market. It substitutes for the print copy that was in the library. And last, that if there is damage, so if someone checking out a book from us, from, from a library, means that they're not going to buy a book, okay, you can argue that's damage, but that's the same damage that first sale actually protects. Libraries lend their print items all the time. It could be that those users are not buying books and they're just borrowing from the library instead. So it is actually the same effect. Now, the one argument that I've heard here is, but wait, technology is different. The digital item circulates faster. You don't have to wait for a patron to return the book. The next patron doesn't have to come down to the library and pick up the book. And I'm going to say that is true. You're right. There are a lot of advantages to to technology. Uh, you could argue the same from our movement from horse and carriage to car to train to FedEx uh, and the van services, drones coming down the line. Everything might be a little bit faster, but again, not every market effect is protected by copyright. The only market effect that they're looking at is, are we displacing sales with our copy? And since our copy replaces the library's copy, our argument is there isn't a market effect that is protected by copyright. And for that reason, the analysis, even under factor four, we think comes out in favor of CDL. 
So even taking all of these factors together, and if the courts say, oh, that is logical, we do agree that, that uh, this comes out and it is a fair use, still libraries or their counsel might argue, but wait, even if this is an absolutely solid argument, there's still a risk. There's a risk of litigation. It doesn't matter if you have a really strong argument, someone can come after you anyway. And that too is true. So some of the things that are covered in a paper that we'll uh, talk about a little bit later is there are mis risk mitigation strategies. So if you are a library that wants to uh, explore CDL, you might choose to only scan materials that are highly, that they don't have an active market right now. So the, there really isn't a market effect. So for example, materials that are out of print, they have no publisher. Um, they had such a limited run that you can't find it commercially. Um, there are all sorts of factors that you can look at. You can focus on nonfiction works or factual works over fiction. So you and your counsel would work that out in terms of whether or not you want to adopt a risk mitigation strategy. Um, the other point that people have raised in terms of risk mitigation is CDL actually works, the analysis works whether or not a publisher has a licensed digital copy of their own. However, in terms of the risk of litigation, if they have current sales ongoing, that it does probably raise the risk of litigation if your users are checking out a digital copy that you've made as opposed to one that's, that, that the publisher is making. And again, that's not that the analysis changes, it's simply that they have an active market, okay? So with that said, um, Chris, can you, sorry, go to the next screen? Yeah, so the last thing that I'll say about this before giving you a quick update on ReDigi, which is not necessarily about controlled digital lending, but is related to it, is just making sure that you have the ability to assess these risks. So if you're someone who is interested in CDL, um, there is an entire page about controlled digital lending, as well as an FAQ and a white paper that outlines the various risks and mitigation strategies that you should read, that you can share with your counsel, and walk through what types of materials you might want to scan for your library. Um, the last thing that I will cover is a case called ReDigi, um, because people ask about this. This is not about CDL, but it was about the resale of uh, digital music. And in this case, the ReDigi court, both the lower court as well as the circuit court, had determined that there was no fair use uh, and there was no first sale. And the reason for that, I think, is significantly different from CDL, so I just wanted to make sure that people understand the difference. Uh, the first is ReDigi was a commercial service, and they never owned the works that they were trying to transfer, right? The, the ownership was such that, the owner in the transfer was such that ReDigi actually could not prove that multiple people weren't actively using the work at the same time. Their mechanism was one that actually didn't guarantee actual transfer. Whereas when you're taking a look at CDL, the libraries are controlling everything. We own the physical item, so we know that we can take it off our shelves. We control the digital item in terms of we're the ones who set the circulation period. Um, it expires after a certain period of time, so the control is entirely ours. So ReDigi is actually fairly easy to distinguish from uh, the CDL practice. So if anyone asks you about that, we can go through that. And there is also a paper on First Monday going through that in greater detail. Thank you, and I'm turning it back over to Chris. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, I'm sure that we'll uh, address the, the questions that I'm seeing uh, come up in chat. Some excellent things uh, uh, posted there, and we'll, we'll gather those at the, at the end. Um, I, I'd like to shift now and do a, a demonstration of controlled digital lending in action. Um, I, I described the, the, the collaboration, the work that, that's been going on between the copyright scholarship community, uh, uh, Michelle and, and others who are writing about controlled digital lending as the theory, and at the Internet Archive, we have a practice of controlled digital lending. We have an implementation of the idea of controlled digital lending. There can and should be other implementations of the idea. We think that it would strengthen um, the, the case for controlled digital uh, lending if there is a, uh, a number of organizations and different approaches um, to doing it. But the Internet Archive, we've invested in, in this. Um, uh, it's, it's part of our roadmap for where we want to make our global literacy impacts. And so it, it's central to the work that we're doing. So I'd like to, uh, to, to just walk through a demonstration of controlled digital lending um, as we have it implemented today at the Internet Archive. So many people are familiar with the Internet Archive and our, our work in backing up the web. We've been doing that since 1996. Um, 
many librarians and, and others are familiar with the book scanning work that we have been doing in partnership with our library partners, um, digitizing materials from library collections, returning those books back to their shelves, um, and making the scanned versions available on archive.org. But what not everyone is, is as familiar with is that the Internet Archive has an active acquisition um, program where we are acquiring books that come to us on donation from either booksellers like Better World Books. We have a fantastic longstanding relationship with Better World Books. We also get donations from libraries that are um, that are weeding their materials that can't put those books into the into the bookseller market. Um, and so we'll, we'll walk through some examples uh, of one library in particular. But so we, the Internet Archive has acquired, uh, we have more than 2.5 million books in our physical archive, which is a series of facilities <clears throat> in Richmond, California, in the Bay Area. We've now digitized more than a million of those books, and that's what you're seeing here. Um, those books have been digitized in our high throughput scanning centers, previously in Hong Kong, now in the Philippines. And so when, uh, when we get book donations, we ship those books uh, to, to be digitized. They come back to our physical archive, and that's where the books remain. And because the physical archive is completely closed access, the only circulation for our material is the scanned copy. So our physical books don't circulate. What does circulate is the electronic copy that we have, uh, that we have created from those scans. And we have more than a million of those books online now. Um, I'm going to do a show an example of, um, of a book that I desperately needed in 1995 um, when I in my first pass at grad school I was a I come from a biology background working on a master's in biology and like many graduate students I was this was I think my last semester in school and I desperately needed a publication that I could not get through interlibrary loan in time now that was not a fault of the library. It was a fault of my own um, as, the, as a student scholar. But I'll show you this book because it is now available um, through controlled digital lending, and I wish that it had been available in the, in the 90s when I needed that book. It's a book called Liquid Assets by um, Sandra Postel and Lisa Masney. It started off as a, government, as a publication, then a government publication, and then was reprinted as a monograph. That book was acquired by the Internet Archive. This came to us uh, through uh, a, a library donation. You can see that it still has some library shelf list uh, label on the, on the front. Um, but that book has been digitized now. Um, it, it has been assigned an ISBN as of monographic publication. It exists in WorldCat. It's sort of, you know, it's a book like we can imagine uh, a full publication. So what I showed previously, the link from Wikipedia, that came in directly to a page. If I'm not linking in directly to a page, I still have the ability to do a limited preview of the book. So I can, um, I can uh, flip pages and look at the front matter of the book, and then I um, uh, can, can see the back of the book. So I just get this limited preview of the front matter, and that gives me enough um, information to say, is this the book that I want? Is this the book that I want to, uh, to check out? And I'm going to do that. So I'm going to uh, log in and borrow, and I'm going to log in with my um, student account, actually, from the University of Missouri. It is a non-privileged account. And so I'm now logged in. And so you can see that I have um, zero of five books on loan. So I can check out um, uh, five books at a time. All I have to have to be able to check out a book is an Internet Archive library card, uh, and that's an Internet Archive account, which is free. So to, get a, to check out books at the Internet Archive, I just need the account. To get the account, I need an email address and an Internet connection. So I've now logged in, and I'm going to click Borrow This Book. And this is where the control, one of the controls in control digital lending comes in. As Michelle mentioned, that there's a, um, an important factor of control digital lending is um, digital rights management. So what you're looking at here, this is what I like to think of as the streaming view of our book. So this is very much, it's exactly the same interface as our open books. If you've looked at any of the books that were published um, in 1923 that are housed at the Internet Archive on archive.org, it's this same interface. The difference between that interface and this, this book that's in controlled digital lending, is that I'm the only user that has access to this view. Um, because we have one copy of this book in our in our system. So uh, you can see I've checked it out. I have the option of returning the book. But if another user comes in uh, and we only have one copy of this book across our network, then only one uh, person uh, can check that book out at a time. And the, the, the user is offered to join a wait list. 
but I've checked this book out. So now I have access to this book for the next 14 days. Not only do I have access to the streaming view, but I also have access to download a PDF or, or an encrypted PDF or an encrypted EPUB. Here's another part of the uh, digital rights management. So if I download the PDF, I get um, high quality images. So it's just page images with OCR text behind the scenes. If I download the EPUB, I'm getting an uncorrected OCR text that has been converted into an EPUB. So it's legible, but it's probably not something that you're going to want to read a novel in its entirety. Think of it as a reference check um, to, to sort of dive in, take a look at the material and say, yeah, this is, uh, this is the thing that I want. It's perfectly legible, but it can be a little bit difficult if you're looking at that EPUB. Certainly the page image view is what we built around and that's the sort of the preferred um, exper user experience. But to use both of those files, the downloaded PDF or the downloaded EPUB, I have to use Adobe Digital Editions, which um, is part of the digital rights management stack um, that, that we make available. So I have access <clears throat> to those downloaded files at the, the, for the same duration that I have for the streaming view. And at the point where I click return it, or when my uh, loan period is over with, I lose access not only to the streaming version, but also to any of the downloads that, I, that I've made available. So my access to this resource is only, is limited by uh, the, the number of days by my, by my circulation, and that goes across all the different versions of the files. Another uh, way of, of interacting with this book, uh, sort of a value add, is that we do have text behind the scenes. So all of our images go through OCR, optical character recognition, as I mentioned before, and we can search through that. So I'm gonna do a search for freshwater. This is a book about freshwater ecology, so you're gonna see a lot of results. What this will show, the, those purple uh, goalposts at the bottom, show me an example or show me where that term freshwater exists across the scanned pages of the book, which is a really great access method to get into, uh, to get into a book. And so what you're seeing here is this is uh, showing on screen on the page where my search term um, exists across the, across the book. So this is the, the book as it exists at the Internet Archive, but many libraries say that's great, it's, it's nice that it exists there, but I have a copy of that book on my shelf and, and I want to link out from my catalog. I want my users to be able to uh, discover this electronic book that is freely available from the Internet Archive from within my catalog. And so we have an example from Georgetown Law Library. So we, we did a comparison of Georgetown Law's um, physical holdings against the Internet Archive's digital holdings so that we could facilitate those links. So if I go to the Georgetown Law Library catalog and I do that same search for liquid assets by Sandra Postel, what we'll see is this uh, um, um, Georgetown's Primo um, interface is going to bring me back the results. Uh, you'll see that this book is available. I'm going to click here to find uh, to see more details about this book. And what it will bring up is it shows me the two different access methods uh, uh, or uh, uh, the, the two ways that this book is available. If you're a Georgetown Law uh, patron, you can access the book through the stacks, uh, the book in its physical version. But we also, again, the Internet Archive provided links to Georgetown Law that said here for, for this ISBN or for this book, here's the URL. And the, uh, the, the librarians uh, pulled that link into the, uh, here's, here's some cataloging for you, into the uh, Mark 856 field to link out from that printed resource to the electronic resource. So I'm going to click on Internet Archives Control Digital Lending um, as a user would. And so because I've already signed in, it's bringing me to the page that I was on um, on the previous window. So uh, there is a, an, an um, our book reader remembers state, so you can drop back in if you leave the book uh, open to a page. When you come back, it will be open to the page that you were on. But this is a round trip example of how books come into our system, digitized, made available, and then referenced by other libraries. So that's a, that's a quick demo uh, round trip through Control Digital Lending. So I'm gonna click return it um, to return this book and make it available for the next person um, so that there's no wait list. Although, um, in full disclosure, I think I'm the only person that has checked this book out. I believe that most of the, the 34 borrows are probably mine um, uh, because I use this book a lot in, in demos. Um, so, that's, uh, so that's controlled digital lending. And let me uh, uh, 
move on to, to talk about other ways that you can access these books. So something certainly that we've got a lot of questions that we've gotten from the library community is that's great, but can we put these books into our um, ebook platform or into uh, how do these books fit into our ebook strategy? And so something that we have been working on is to make our books work in Simply E. This is a consolidated library reader, um, an app that you can download onto your phone or your mobile device. And you can bring up that same million books that we make available through the web are also now available through Simply E. So you can browse, you can add the Internet Archive as a catalog. You can browse and search through the books just as I did with that. Uh, you could find liquid assets. And the, if, you, if you follow across the screenshots uh, taken from a mobile device, you see the catalog Then I've drilled into the first book that's in the upper left corner. You can see that I can click to, um, to get that book and then read that book. And when I click read, or I'm sorry, when I click get, I get the same login information that asked me to sign in with my Internet Archive library card. So we use, it's the same authentication throughout the system, um, regardless of the device that you're on or the platform that you're accessing the content from. And it, I have this, this, uh, this, ac this access to this book for the same loan period for 14 days. The difference, because of the way that Simply E works, the, the file that we make available is that EPUB that's created from uncorrected OCR. So again, this is an, uh, a suitable access method. It is not the kind of thing that you would want to, to sit down and read a novel um, uh, through. So in, in some ways, what we're offering is a, a bit of a subpar version of the book. It, I think that also kind of goes towards like the market harm. This isn't a pristine EPUB like you would get from the Kindle store. This is a, 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 an accessible version um, that, that is suitable for, for scholarship, for reading and for, and for reference. But important still to make our content available on mobile devices. Um, and this is an area that I anticipate we'll be spending a lot more um, that we're are gearing up to spend more time on to make sure that that, um, that simply experience is as good as possible. But we do get this question a lot, which is, well, where do you get your books? And I mentioned that we have uh, great relationships with Better World Books and with libraries. And I want to give you uh, an example from Trent University. So Trent University in Ontario faced a classic librarian's dilemma. The uh, Trent, the, the library went through a major renovation project. All of the books were moved out and the library could only move 50% of its collection back in. The space was being reused for programming, events, etc. Uh, a, common, a common occurrence in many academic libraries and public libraries for that matter. Um, and so as libraries are, are evaluating their print collections, the Internet Archive is, uh, is a good home for those, uh, for those books. So rather than put the books into the book trade, Trent donated those books to the Internet Archive knowing that we would digitize those books and make them available to our community of users. So in, in a sense, the Trent faculty were somewhat comforted by the, uh, this approach because they weren't losing access to the books, they were gaining enhanced access to the books like I demonstrated with that full text search and the ability to look at it on a, on a number of devices. So that was, that was uh, uh, somewhat good for the faculty. They were more comfortable with this idea of losing half the physical collection, knowing that, the, that they would still have access to the books. So the books came to us in um, uh, it's boxes within boxes. That's the way that we ship. It's also the way that we store the materials. So what you're looking at here, these are boxes. So there's books in boxes, boxes on pallets, pallets in containers. And you're seeing a shipping container, a 40 foot shipping container, like you would see going down a train or, uh, or down the highway or on, sea or on a, a barge um, full of books. That's how they came to us. That's how they get shipped to the, to the Philippines. That's how they live when they come back to the, uh, to the United States and live in our physical archive. They are in this, uh, you know, books in boxes, boxes on pallets, pallets in containers. So this was a, a shipment as it was getting ready to go to the Philippines for digitization. Um, and that was uh, late last year. I'm pleased to say today, um, as of today, we've digitized more than 150,000 of those books, of that 250,000. Now, some of those books were duplicates. And when we, in, when we encounter a book at the time of scanning, and it's something that we've already digitized, we donate that book to literacy programs. And if it hasn't been digitized, then we scan it, and then we hold on to that physical copy because that's the one copy against which we um, are, are making our digital loans. So here's 150,000 of, uh, of the books from Trent 
have been digitized. And something that I think is really important to look at is if you look at the availability pane that's along the left. So there's 151,000 books. Um, uh, 5,000 of those are always available, meaning that they are not in control digital lending. Those are books that are in the public domain, and so they don't have to have any kind of, uh, any kind of controls around them. They are just always available. So, but if we look at the wait list, those, that 24,000, nearly 25,000 books that are checked out, I think that's fantastic. That's 17% of the collection. Now, the way that Trent made its selection was that they identified low circulation monographs published from the 1970s to the 1990s. Those were the books that they were looking at uh, moving out of their space. These are books that in, in situ, local to Trent, rarely, if ever circulated and here by digitizing them and making them available to a global audience 17 percent of those books are now on loan which i think is is fantastic it's also um, because we've been working with wikipedia these books uh where where they are referenced in wikipedia are now connected to wikipedia so scholars are able to access those books you know read references in wikipedia follow the reference to a scanned copy that came from trent university so again, I just think this is a, um, you know, thinking about, you know, every, every book it's reader and every reader it's book. Here's a great example of that happening live on the web um, from these materials that, that wouldn't have found their audience um, otherwise. And we get, um, this isn't only an academic library uh, uh, solution. Um, the, if you think about the materials that are held in public libraries, the, the sort of the shifting nature or the changing nature over time of what a public library has in its collection affects the availability of materials. And so we, we got this, uh, uh, this, this great note from a, from a librarian colleague who, who came to one of the webinars, was looking and considering uh, controlled digital lending, and went to go find one of her favorite children's books, uh, which was Winter Cottage by Carol Ryrie Brink, who was published in 1968. And as she writes, it used to be in every library collection, but it's now out of print, with Amazon selling used copies at $50 and up. We have it freely available. She was able to check it out and read it over a cold, snowy uh, winter weekend, which I just, you know, I think that's, uh, again, I think that's really, really awesome. Um, so we get these kinds of messages uh, from our community a lot. And uh, um, I, I wanna put more of these messages, uh, this impact and the feedback that we get from our community. It's really meaningful. So shifting a little bit uh, to, to now, how can libraries participate? Well, you can join open libraries, and that's just a simple online form. A note to, um, uh, as Nick mentioned, he'll be sending out a, uh, a link to the video for this, uh, uh, for this presentation. We'll also include a link for this presentation, um, and so you'll have access to all of the links that we've embedded um, through, uh, through it. What happens when you join open libraries, it's an online form, it's a Google form, and it says, I wanna participate in open libraries. Um, what you do then is share your catalog. So we take a, an export of your MARC records, and we run, our engineers run an overlap study. They look for your physical holdings and compare that against our digital holdings, the books that we've digitized. Where there's a match, we can provide back to the library that link that you can bring into your catalog, like I showed with the Georgetown Law example. We also, at that point, ask libraries, would you be willing to put a copy of that book into our lending counts? Can we lend? a digital copy of your physical book. Now in the case of Georgetown Law, we just provided the links. Georgetown hasn't put its uh, lending counts into our pool, um, but there are other libraries that have. So 25 libraries have signed on to open libraries, and there are a number of libraries, including Hamilton Public Library um, in Canada, that have said, take all of our books, lend them out. We know, the, the so, the, 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 the issue, the, the question comes up about circulation control. How does a library do that? That's a local library decision and the Internet Archive doesn't make those um, decisions uh, for, on the library's behalf. Different libraries, uh, it, as uh, to, to Michelle's point of risk mitigation, different libraries can take different approaches. Some libraries are just looking at the materials that are in um, off-site facilities or off-site storage. Some libraries are putting materials that don't circulate, like uh, reference collections. Um, and some libraries are saying the likelihood of all of the digital copies being checked out at the same time that my physical copy is being checked out is so low, I'm willing to accept the risk. Um, and again, that's at the individual library's um, um, decision. 
Uh, and, and a final important point on this is that the cost is zero. This is a non-commercial service. Um, we are providing this free to libraries and free to the public um, because we, uh, we are invested in literacy at global scale and this is one way of, of making that happen. And so uh, as we wrap, um, some, some things that I, that I would hope that you would take away from, uh, from our presentation. Um, uh, Michelle mentioned that there's the statement on controlled digital lending, which you can look at controlleddigitallending.org. That statement is available for um, both individuals as well as institutions to endorse. So you can, um, you can endorse the, the statement on controlled digital lending, and I'd, I'd encourage everyone to consider doing that. Joining open libraries, then we can do that comparison of collections and you can see where there's that overlap. And then finally, consider donating books to the Internet Archive for reformatting. Um, as, as Michelle mentioned, this is, this is a format shift. Um, and so that's what we are doing. We are reformatting these materials, moving them from, from print to digital, from analog to digital. And if you want to learn more um, about controlled digital lending and the Open Libraries program, there are some upcoming opportunities uh, where you can learn more. So on October 23rd, the Internet Archive will be holding our annual Library Leaders Forum and evening celebration that will be in San Francisco at the Internet Archive. And you can register for that and learn more at libraryleadersforum.org. And in November um, at the Charleston Conference, there will be a series of presentations touching on aspects of controlled digital lending. So Brewster Kale, the founder of the Internet Archive, will be giving a, a, an opening keynote on the first full day of the conference. There will be a panel presentation that I'll be facilitating with Brewster and others. And then Michelle is giving a presentation, I believe it's on Friday, is that right, Michelle? That's correct, that's yeah, correct. On, on the, the legal aspects of controlled digital lending. So, that brings us to a close. And Michelle, uh, before we dive into Q&A, is there anything else that you'd like to, to add uh, into the discussion? No, I think you've done a great wrap up in terms of how it works and how to, how to start doing it for the library. Great, thanks. So now, um, Nick, I'll turn to you. I wonder if you can maybe um, uh, summarize some questions or is there, are there any common themes, um, things that we can address in this last, uh, last bit of the presentation? Yeah, for sure. Lots of questions. Uh, maybe we can do a, a lightning round, <laughs> see how many we can get through. Uh, feel free to keep contributing those in the, the chat. Um, so I'll start with a, a handful of questions just around contributing books uh, to the project. I feel like you know, that's such a, a priority for the libraries on the, the webcast to sort of understand how to participate, what that looks like. And there are a few questions there. Um, and so, you know, some of the questions on that front are, you know, will the Internet Archive scan any books that are donated? What about journals? Um, do you ever discard uh, donations? Um, you know, do, should libraries be you know, checking to see if things that they might donate are duplicates of what you have? Do you welcome duplicates or should uh, local libraries screen those out? What's your, uh, your approach there? <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can address uh, some of those. So the, the first one for journals, no. Um, we're not taking down journals. Um, the Internet Archive has acquired a very large microfilm collection, um, and so we're planning to scan, and when I say very large, I mean very large, like a half billion pages of microfilm. Um, and so we're planning to digitize from microfilm, not from bound periodicals. So we're not taking journals at this time. We have developed a wish list. So we we put together um, uh, the, the, the uh, books that are cited in Wikipedia, the 1.2 million most widely held books according to OCLC, which was done a few years ago, um, Library Link, the holdings of North American libraries, and Open Syllabi, the books that are um, uh, assigned in, in course readings, put all of those together and came up with a wish list of 1.5 million books that we are particularly interested in. And we have a blog post and we make that list available. That's really the books that we want. But we also have a, an odd collection development priority for many libraries, which is we want one of anything we don't already have. So we, we will take it all. Um, do we donate books? Yes, we do donate books um, to, uh, to literacy efforts and then also to Better World Books where we can. Um, do we discard materials? Yes, if there's no, if we can't get, the, if we can't put them into a, uh, if we can't find a suitable home for them, um, re recycling is our last resort. Um, maybe that was, uh, maybe that was it. I, I don't know if Nick, if there was another question, maybe we should just move on. Yeah, I mean, there's a follow-up to uh, slightly different, but is there a limit on the number of e-copies that you'll digitize of a single book? Uh, great question. So we are um, we are only holding one copy. That's actually how controlled digital lending scales. Because we're only holding one copy, we need libraries to join open libraries so that we can have additional copies to lend. Um, so 
so we can have more than the one copy. Um, so we'll only hold one copy, um, but if a library continues to hold that book, then we can, um, then we can lend it um, on the library's behalf. Great, and you're mentioning, uh, well, so one of other fault, do you accept the donations from individuals as well? We do, um, uh, we do accept individual donations, but um, we generally tend to prefer to get large collections. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Often when, we, when we're getting smaller collections, we're trying to route those through the, through the booksellers. Great, and then uh, another few questions sort of related to, to how libraries can make use of this is, uh, you know, do you provide mark records so that libraries can add um, your CDL books into their uh, ILS systems? We do. Um, so we make our MARC records available. We also make MARC XML records available. And we've been working on a process with OCLC so that all of those million books that we've digitized are now referenced not only in WorldCat, but also in OCLC's knowledge base. And that's that the knowledge base piece is something that is really new um, and um, uh, actually isn't, isn't completely done yet. But the idea would be that libraries could use the controlled, the books that are in Internet Archives Controlled Digital Lending Service as a comparator in things like Green Glass and other OCLC products so that you could be using this digitized collection um, to, to view the, uh, through which to view your print collection. Great. Uh so, okay, sprinting through to uh, another topic, um, one of the, the questions um, was speaking to sort of the intersection of CDL with interlibrary loan, uh, and sort of what's your perspective on CDL being adapted to be used in IOL? Uh, is that something that, yeah, I guess what's your, what are your thoughts there? Uh, sure, so I can speak a little to that. Uh, uh, so uh, two things. Uh, one thing that I had forgotten to mention that is very important and I know also came up in the questions is, the analysis, the legal analysis that we provided is based on U.S. law. So if there are listeners from outside of the U.S., fair use and for sale does not exist in every country. In fact, it, so, so you would absolutely need to check the laws within your jurisdiction to see how that applies. Uh, but generally speaking, within the U.S., if we're taking a look at interlibrary loan, uh, my perspective of that is the argument is just as strong for using CDL for ILL as it is for any library use. So whether it's ILL, consortium use, other use, as long as you keep true to the principles of CDL, which is you're never lending more than one copy at a time, or however many copies the library owns at a time, that is still consistent with CDL. Great, and uh, is there a system for sort of notifying the Internet Archive if a copy is lost or destroyed to take it out of circulation? So the, the way that we are um, planning to address that is to do um, periodic quarterly updates of the contributing libraries or the partner libraries so that we can add, you know, we're adding new books into our collection every day. Libraries collections are changing on a regular basis as well. And so we want to do that quarterly refresh so that we can keep everything in sync. Great. Uh, let's see if I can fit two more questions on uh, in <laughs> the 45 seconds we have left. Um, one of the questions came in around accessibility that I really wanted to make sure to hit on. Um, and I noticed uh, that spoken to and sort of the interface, but could you speak more uh, to the accommodations you make for accessibility for those who need it? Yeah, actually, so all of the materials, this started as a solution for the print disabled community. Um, so people who are blind and low vision, if you are print disabled, you actually, um, there's no wait list. Um, if you are, uh, if, if a qualifying authority can say, yes, you are, um, uh, you, you uh, qualify for access to, to materials, you go straight to the, the head of the line. There's no wait list. You can check out any of the books that are in our collection. Um, and so the, uh, the, the solution that we have, the, the text is really, sort of better for people with low vision and other print disabilities like dyslexia as opposed to blind uh, individuals. But this is something that we're also wanting to work on and improve for sure. Great, and the final question. Um, there were a few that came in around sort of privacy and uh, the DRM that's, that's involved. Um, and so, you know, just to close, it'd be great to hear your aspect on, or your sort of response to both, you know, do uh, the registration for users need to be linked to individuals um, or just email addresses uh, and what are the privacy protections involved for patrons using uh, Internet Archive system? Yeah, um, so uh, I can speak to, the, to those issues directly from the Internet Archive, and then I'd be kind of be interested if, if Michelle has a view on this as well. At the Internet Archive, we don't track IP addresses. Um, we, we take reader privacy incredibly seriously. Um, we are a library, um, not just a website, and so we, we are not tracking your information. Um, that we don't, 
um, uh, we're not making reading lists available. Um, so yeah, a reader privacy is incredibly important to us. Michelle, anything? Uh, sure, and the only thing that I would add is in terms of CDL and compliance with it, I think that the library just complies with its usual restrictions on who borrows materials from them. And as long as they do that, it should be fine. So that's determined at the local level more than anything else. Perfect. Well, I'm sad that we'll have to leave it there, uh, but really appreciate all the questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them, uh, but the lively discussion was great. Um, and again, thank you uh, so much, uh, Chris and Michelle, for the presentation. This has been um, really, really valuable. Um, and as we mentioned at the top, we will circulate an email as soon as we have the recording available to everyone registered um, so that you can rewatch and share with others. And again, there'll be a link to a survey in that email. And we really appreciate your feedback there that helps us improve uh, these, these Spark webcasts. So uh, thanks again, uh, Michelle and Chris, and thanks to everybody uh, joining this afternoon. Have a good, have a good one. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everyone.